Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, part of the Marine Protected Areas Center webinar series sponsored by NOAA's National Marine Protected Areas Center and UCTO. I'm Zach Canizzo with NOAA's National Marine Protected Areas Center, and I will be your moderator today. We're very excited for today's webinar titled The ONO Index, Detecting Novel Ocean Conditions for MPA Management, and presented by Dr. Stephen Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a native Hawaiian scientist from the island of Saipan in Micronesia. His work focuses on, coastal, on how coastal communities, particularly those in Pacific Islands, interact with marine ecosystems and adapt to the impacts of the climate crisis. Dr. Johnson is currently a Provost's Future Faculty Fellow in the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment at Cornell, Cornell University, where he will be an Assistant Professor starting August 2023. We are very excited to have Dr. Johnson here today, but before I turn it over to, to our speaker, I would like to let you know that we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation as they occur to you. Please type them into the questions box, which is found at the bottom of your control panel, often found on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will pose the questions to Dr. Johnson at the end of the presentation. With that, I will turn things over to Dr. Johnson. All right, thank you, Zach. Um, I'm, uh, can you give me a thumbs up to make sure that uh, my presentation's um, being displayed properly? Yep, we're seeing it. All right, thanks. Uh, so hi everyone, I wanna thank you for uh, sharing some of your precious time with me today to talk about climate change, our oceans and marine protected areas. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, the team at OCTO along with um, the National Marine Protected Area Center for hosting today's webinar. Um, and again, I really encourage a lot of questions, um, put them in the chat. Um, I'd love to hear people's thoughts on uh, the work, um, where they might see it uh, working in some of the on the ground management that I think uh, many of uh, you in the audience are, are working on. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge quickly my co-author uh, on this work, Dr. James Watson at Oregon State University. So this is a quick outline, and this is the paper that um, will kind of take up the bulk of, um, of our talk today, which, is, which was published last year in the journal One Earth. Um, so we're going to talk about MPAs and climate change, and then I'll walk you through how we developed the Ocean Novelty Index, or the ONO Index, um, which we use to assess um, how we might um, expect climate change to impact marine protected areas. Then at the end, I'd like to have an open discussion as well as we could through the, um, through the webinar. Um, so again, encouraging everyone to put questions into the chat. So uh, to begin, we're gonna define our key term today, and that's gonna be marine protected areas. Um, and uh, the one definition we might use for MPAs is that they are clearly defined geographical spaces recognized, dedicated, and managed through local or other effective means to achieve long-term conservation of nature with associated ecosystem services and cultural values. Um, additionally, we know that different levels of protection are associated with a variety of outcomes for marine protected areas. But protection is only one part of the equation when we start thinking about the possible futures of MPAs. Uh, this figure you see here uh, was, uh, comes from um, a paper in science last year, the MPA guide, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And in the MPA guide, it discussed how different levels of protection within marine protected areas um, can lead to different possible futures depending on that level of protection. Lightly protected MPAs might uh, not have the biodiversity outcomes um, associated with those um, in fully protected areas. But again, um, this is only half the equation because MPAs can't um, stop the ocean conditions itself from changing. So again, climate change is going to play um, a large role in the outcomes that we might realistically expect from MPAs. So to tee up the conversation around the Ocean Novelty Index and how we applied it to large marine protected areas, I think it's important that we start with a brief recap of the intersection of MPA science and climate change. So we're gonna start off with the giant caveat, this uh, list here, these five uh, papers that I um, pulled out are not exhaustive. And uh, from the time this presentation was created to when it's being presented today, I'm sure we can all think of new um, exciting research uh, that contributes to this conversation around marine protected areas and climate science. Um, but I just want to cover the broad general strokes of this area. 
So what jumps out to me when we look at this smattering of journal articles is that most of these um, work, most of this research is around the concept of design. What can we do to ensure that MPAs perform well? Here we might think about topics like design principles, uh, such as where to place an MPA or habitat representation, you know, where we want to ensure that all the interdependent ecosystems like seagrass meadows and coral reefs are protected. And we know that these design principles will give ecosystems the best chance of maintaining their inherent resilience to climate change. But again, unfortunately, MPAs don't stop the biogeochemical conditions of the ocean itself from changing. So this brings about a need to uh, dive into the research around the emergence of novel ocean environments. Um, so I think like many of you in the, in the audience today, uh, we spend an unhealthy amount of time thinking and reading about climate change, and we become very familiar with these types of figures and plots, especially um, you know, this time of year around the, the COP meetings that are happening uh, in Egypt. Um, so, right, these uh, time series plots show temperature anomalies that are estimated from Earth system models, and that we apply these to global maps to, um, to try and figure out where and when environmental change is, is going to happen. And we acknowledge that these maps are very important. They are powerful visual aids in communicating the severity of the climate crisis, in communicating um, you know, the urgency of action to policymakers but they can also be a bit abstract at times, right? Some places are just really red, and what does that really mean for our shared and collective future? And so my co-author and I, we wanted to develop a new measure of climate change that better encapsulates the lived experience of the ocean that we all know and what that might look like um, for future generations. So to, to explain this, we're gonna start with a simple question, and that is, what are we comparing the future ocean to? Or simply put, what is normal? So normal in this case would be defined by the distribution or range of conditions we see in a given place over a given period of time. So, it, so to illustrate how um, we've defined normal and compared it to a range of future climate scenarios, we're going to start by focusing on a specific place and look at one of the world's largest marine protected areas, the Palau National Marine Sanctuary. And what we're looking at here is a graph of modeled sea surface temperatures for a historical period in gray, uh, which is the period from 1970 to 2014. And we looked out into three future climate scenarios um, and we were using the newest uh, shared socioeconomic pathways um, or SSPs. So one thing that is often reported um, with, these, with this type of data is the change in the average temperature as illustrated here. So this is very useful, but most of us, we don't experience mean conditions because the mean is a time integrated statistic. For example, um, if you live in Oregon, you could expect a mean annual high temperature of 63 degrees, which is actually the high temperature for only three months out of the year. So more often than not, you're not experiencing mean conditions making the mean, a limited and sometimes overused statistic. In addition to the mean, we also report the change in extremes. So here we can imagine reporting on the change in the maximum temperature experienced uh, in the ocean around Palau. And I think this is a little bit better because it gets at the visceral experience of climate change, and it also um, speaks to a lot of the thermal upper limits and tolerance ranges for species that we care about. But we also have to consider that uh, there's some research on the psychology of climate change communication that shows talking too much about extreme climate events can cause paralysis by fear or lend itself to attacks by climate deniers who weaponize the absence of such extreme events um, to, to try and disprove that climate change is happening. But what I really want to get at is a metric that captures the shift in familiarity of a given dimension of climate change, something that encompasses the whole distribution and not just a given moment. So we're gonna use um, Oregon as an example. And if someone were to ask you about the temperature in Oregon before moving there, um, you'd want to tell them about the annual mean high temperature since it's not what they experience. 
I would probably talk about the extremes, right? In the summer, it can be hot and dry, but it can be cold, wet, and gray in the winter, and talk about how you feel in fall and how you really dislike the spring. So luckily, um, we do have something in information theory that can help us explain these changes. So we're gonna consider this cartoon here. And on the y-axis, we have the probability density function for temperature. And on the x-axis, we have all the possible future temperatures with cool temperatures on the left-hand side and warm ones on the right-hand side. And so we can expect that climate change is going to shift this distribution to the right. So the mean and all of the moments that contribute to defining the mean um, will also move to warmer values and so on and so on and so forth. And so instead of simply measuring the change um, in mean temperature, we can use um, a measurement called the Hellinger distance to measure how much information is contained in one probability distribution relative to the other. And in this case, we're gonna be referencing the cool blue baseline. So as the temperature distribution shifts to the right, the overlap with the cool blue distribution diminishes and the Hellinger distance goes up until the point where there's no overlap um, between the two distributions and we have a value of one. So this is how we're gonna be measuring novelty um, in the ocean conditions and apply those to marine protected areas. Um, so when, for the purposes of this study, when the Hellinger distance is greater than 0.5 or 50%, um, we consider this to be a state of novelty because there's more new information in the shifted distribution than not. And so for those of you familiar with these kind of metrics, the Hellinger distance is related to the Jensen-Shannon distance as well as the Kolbeck-Liebler divergence. Um, the only major difference here is that the Hellinger distance is neatly bounded from zero to one, where these other um, distance measures are unbounded to infinity. And so to uh, hammer the point home a bit more, I want to share one more example of why this is a useful measure um, of change. So the example I just walked us through shows a normal distribution that simply shifts along the x-axis. And this is maybe the most cartoonish and basic way that uh, we might expect change to occur. Um, but we know that another situation might occur where it's not necessarily a wholesale shift in conditions, but the shape of the distribution um, of our data is changing. And so we might experience more of a particular temperature than we're used to. And these types of changes are often lost when we restrict our analysis to the mean conditions or the extremes. So this is the um, figure we'd be looking at here where um, we don't see a wholesale shift in, in the distribution, but we see a change in the shape of the distribution. And in this example here, a Hellinger distance between these two distributions is 0.4. So there's a 0.4 or a 40% difference between the two um, distributions. And as you can see, many of the higher values no longer exist. Um, in the new distribution. And so with this information and this kind of tool at our disposal, um, you know, we can now uh, develop a way that we might measure a departure from normal. And so my research here was centering on developing a way to measure that normal due to climate change for the ocean. So the Ocean Novelty Index or um, the cheeky uh, uh, name that we came up with it was the ONO index, because as your values continue to increase towards one or 100, you increasingly have this urge to scream, oh no. Um, and the ONO index does just uh, what we were hoping to by calculating the Hellinger distance um, for a set of key biogeochemical variables under a set of different climate change scenarios. So for the work you'll be seeing in this presentation, uh, we used a multivariate measurement of climate change. Uh, so we looked at chlorophyll, oxygen, um, ocean pH, silica concentrations, sea surface temperature, and zooplankton uh, abundance. And we did this across three different climate change scenarios, um, SSP245, SSP370, and SSP585. 
so the, the data that we used was coming from the coupled model intercomparison project phase six or cmip six and for those of you unfamiliar with cmip is a collaborative framework designed to improve knowledge of climate change by soliciting climate and earth system model to execute experiments um, so these experiments can include historical hindcasts which we use um, within our uh, work here as well as climate forecasts um, there's also a whole other suite of um, models that you might uh, be interested in looking in and so the cmip6 is also used for developing climate scenarios um, which we are now calling shared socioeconomic pathways um, for some of you you may be more familiar with the representative concentration pathways uh, from the previous uh, cmip cmip5 um, and this figure here shows kind of how the RCPs and SSPs uh, relate and speak to one another. And these are the three um, SSPs, again, that um, we'll be discussing in the work today. And so they would kind of be a correlate to RCP uh, 4.5, one slightly above RCP 6.0, and then one uh, that um, is the equivalent to RCP 8.5. And the resolution of the data that we used was a one degree by one degree grid cell. And we used that resolution since it was the one common one for all the variables um, that we ended up assessing. So now we're going to look at novelty in action. And so we're going to go back to um, uh, Palau and the Palau National Marine Sanctuary as, um, as our toy example here. And so the Palau National Marine Sanctuary is one of the largest MPAs in the world. Um, it's, in fact, the ninth largest MPA in the world. Okay, so what does novelty actually look like? in Palau. So if you look at the top left panel here, what we're, we've done is we've overlaid the near future temperature distribution. These are sea surface temperatures um, for the years 2015 through 20, uh, 2029. And so again, these are coming from the climate models, not in situ measurements. Um, and so each of the climate models are colored, um, or each of the climate scenarios are colored um, a different color. So we have green for SSP245, purple for SSP370, uh, and orange for SSP8.5. And then we have the historical baseline from 1970 through 2014 in gray. So that'll be uh, in the back. And so as you see here, we have three values, 25, 24, and 31 as our novelty values of what 2015 through 2029 looks like compared to that historical baseline. And so these are all calculated using the Hellinger distance. And so now uh, we can look all the way forward into the future in the bottom right panel. So again, the color distributions uh, relate to the same climate scenarios moving forward. The gray is still our historical distribution. And what we can see now is we have uh, much higher values um, for novelty listed here. Um, in this figure. So we can see uh, for SSP245, where at the beginning of the century we were um, at a value of 25, our Hellinger distance or our novelty index is now up to a value of 65. For SSP585, uh, the most extreme climate scenario that might happen, uh, we started off with a value of 31 and we're now at a value of 93. And all three of these values, you can see they have an asterisk next to them. It's because they exceed our threshold for novelty, which would be um, 0.5 or 50%. So this uh, highlights the emergence of novel conditions. And you, know, you can look through each of these uh, decadal panels and you can see that we start to tip over into these novel conditions around mid-century um, if we're just looking at sea surface temperatures. And so uh, we don't have to restrict ourselves um, simply to sea surface temperatures. We can look at other dimensions of climate change. Um, for example, we might look at sea surface uh, pH levels. Um, and this is somewhat a, a useful and not so useful example because uh, pH levels are being driven directly by uh, carbon uh, atmospheric uh, concentrations. And so we see striking departure among the emission scenarios. 
through here. And if we were to lay these uh, distributions out um, along each other like this, we can see um, how severe the changes are um, given how much carbon uh, that the ocean is absorbing. And uh, you know, through most of the, the century, we see values of 100. So now I want to take you into some of the findings of the paper in specific uh, to kind of uh, get us moving more towards um, our open discussion at the end. So the first finding of our research was not uh, specifically um, looking at large marine protected areas. What we wanted to do first was kind of set um, the landscape for the ocean writ large. And so what we found was that no matter the future course, um, large areas of the ocean will undergo significant um, change or enter into some state of novelty by the year 2100. Um, this effect is most uh, pronounced in tropical regions, uh, the southern Indian and Atlantic Ocean as well. Um, the panels D through I you see in this figure relate to the individual variables and what those conditions will look like um, at the end of the century under SSP 585. You can see in panel F which is for pH, um, everything is in a novel state, um, kind of given the amount of carbon that the ocean is absorbing. Uh, in panel E, we can see uh, mass bands around uh, the equator where we're getting lots of deoxygenization. Um, and you know, in panel H, we can see uh, sea, sea surface temperatures also increase, increasing in these same areas. So our second finding, um, again, is, is not focusing particularly on uh, protected areas, but it's still useful to set the stage for that conversation. And this is that the number of variables exceeding the threshold for novelty varies spatially, but all regions will exceed um, this threshold for novelty for at least one of those dimensions by 2100. And so this is showing kind of the onset of when individual um, what percentage of the ocean will be tipping over into a new state of um, you know, environmental conditions. And you can see this in panel D, we have uh, the percentage of ocean area that will be turning into a state of novelty at each decade across the different climate scenarios. In panel E, um, we have the emergence of novelty for at least two uh, dimensions. So again, we're looking at the percentage um, of ocean surface area that has at least two of our uh, dimensions exceeding that threshold. And then the, the map panels there show the cumulative numbers of um, dimensions that exceed the novelty threshold um, across our three different climate scenarios. So while, uh, you know, looking at these findings, you know, I want us to remember that a lot of the work, a lot of work is going on to reverse the uh, the trends we're seeing in climate change, there's a big push for climate adaptation to address loss and damages um, and finding new and you know, equitable and just ways to support social and environmental resilience. Um, you know, and what, a part of that toolkit is um, protected areas and in particular, large protected areas. Um, and so the results I'm gonna show you now are applying this um, novelty, this ONO index um, assessment to the world's largest marine protected areas. And these very large marine protected areas cover at least 100,000 square kilometers in area, and they make up about 93% of all of our um, protected area across the world. Um, so it's important to remember that these MPAs take years and years and years of advocacy and planning um, to get any type of support for, to get the adequate funding um, to, to support them to make sure that they work well. Um, but despite all of that, th it doesn't make these areas any less vulnerable or susceptible to the impacts of the changing ocean. So I was curious to see how exposed or how vulnerable um, these large protected areas would be to a novel ocean future. And so the third kind of final finding we have um, in applying the ONO index to large protected areas is that on average across 29 of these very large marine protected areas, by the end of the century um, under the worst climate change scenario, um, we would see an average value of 56. 
Um, and this varies across um, the large MPA depending on where it is in the world. And so in panel B, I, I selected a, a subsample of those 29 largest MPAs and uh, depicted their novelty index calculations. And so um, for the Palau National Marine Sanctuary in the year 2100, uh, we could expect uh, its, no its average novelty to be um, a value of 74. For the Ross Sea uh, protected area um, around Antarctica, we could expect um, something that's not quite novel um, on average with the value of 44. So this is kind of the expected range we have for all of our large marine protected areas. And this is kind of where now I want to transition into the Q&A uh, part of our conversation today um, to, you know, to ask you, uh, you know, folks doing the research, doing the, um, uh, the management on the ground, you know, where do we see this type of information being useful? Um, you know, what are some uh, interesting or exciting ways we might be able to uh, improve upon this novelty index? Because, uh, you know, we were dealing with pretty coarse um, uh, resolution and climate models, and uh, that applies to the future as well um, as the uh, historical conditions. So it'd be really interesting to, uh, you know, find a way to apply this to many uh, of the smaller MPAs that exist out there um, and not just um, you know, leave this as an assessment for the, the big ones. Um, so uh, with that, um, maybe Zach, we could hop into the, the chat. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Dr. Johnson for the presentation. Uh, anyone who does have a question, please do feel free to drop it into the question box at the bottom of your um, at the bottom of your uh, toolkit that's sitting over on the right hand side of your screen. We do have one question that's come in so far asking you note that you use the larger MPAs. Is this due to a cell resolution that you were working with? Because you were using yeah. the MPAs? Yeah, I know given that the the common resolution of the climate models was one degree, uh, which is quite a, a very large uh, distance um, when we think about the size of most of our MPAs. Um, so we uh, we decided we would have to limit it to our larger MPAs. So for some of the climate variable or some of the five geochemical variables we looked at, there were higher resolution models down to the um, 50 kilometer resolution, um, but we wanted to kind of get a multi-dimensional understanding of how climate change was going to impact um, the ocean and apply that to MPAs. And uh, this was unfortunately the, the best uh, compromise we could make. A follow-up to that is someone wondering whether or not it would be possible to use downscaled models and apply them uh, with your index. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's one of the really, uh, the, the beauty of using something like the Hellinger distance um, is that you could use um, you know, downscaled models. Um, there have been some new uh, papers that have come out recently um, using slightly different uh, measurements of uh, novelty, but they've, they've been applying um, this type of thinking to smaller um, or higher resolution um, climate models. Great, thank you. Again, uh, to any of the attendees, please do enter any questions you have in the question box. We have plenty of time to ask Dr. Johnson some questions. Um, another question is uh, asking whether or not you have already developed or have any plans to develop a tool that a uh, marine protected area manager could use to calculate their own oil index. Yeah, um, we, there is. We have a framework for that, but again, the um, the kind of the limiting factor there is access to the appropriate data um, that would allow the proper um, kind of assessment or the calculation of the Hellinger distance and the novelty index for that given area. Um, I do, I do want to make note that the code we use to calculate the novelty index is available um, if, if you go to the uh, page for the paper and I'd be happy to kind of present this out in the notes it's on it's on my github uh, folks could pull down that code uh, to 
to see the, kind of the analytical framework we use and if they have their own data um, that they could then plug that in. Um, but we would hope to, uh, you know, find the resources to invest in something that managers could, you know, access online. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, another question has come in asking, saying that first comment, then a question follows it up, saying it seems like this could be a useful measurement that could be used to capture ecological transformation under an approach such as the resist, resist except direct model that's being used by the National Park System. Is that something that you've looked into? Um, I have not looked into it uh, myself, but I have been, you know, kind of presenting this work in a couple of different forums. And, you know, there's, you know, there's so much creative thinking around what novel uh, conditions mean for for natural resource management and conservation. Um, there's a group in um, the Pacific Islands uh, who really focus on invasive species response and using perhaps this um, novelty detection as a way to, you know, if, if we know that our area is going to be novel, you know, where might that, um, where might those conditions exist today? And what species, what ecosystems um, currently reside in there that might be, you know, migrating, you know, as a kind of an early warning system. So there are, you know, you could use this as a, a tool to prepare for adaptation planning, you know, uh, for invasive species monitor monitoring. And so I think the the tool itself is flexible and amenable enough, and the calculation is straightforward and simple enough that you know you could find a number of applications for it. Great, yeah, lots of really cool potential applications. Um, someone noting that they were surprised at the results for the that you uh, show it, throw it up there, threw up there for the Ross Sea, and they're wondering if you have any idea of why novelty wasn't changing as fast in that area as some of the other places where you display results. Um, some of it could be um, the, the size of, uh, of the protected area um, and you know, whether that protected area is traversing a large um, you know, latitudinal gradient um, as opposed to a longitudinal gradient um, because sometimes if you, if the protected area is you know covering a lot of latitudinal gradient you might have individual grid cells going through a lot of change so if we looked at one specific one degree by one degree um, part of the ocean and kept tracking that over time it might be changing but if it is a part of another um, but if there is, if it is merely replacing the value that another grid cell within that protected area had, then they kind of off, they cancel out each other. So it, it could be an artifact of that, which is again one of uh, maybe one of the limitations of of this approach is um, that you 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 might just be swapping the values within, and so it's limiting how much um, change. But that could also be a sign of um, resilience given you know the large spatial coverage which is one of the things that large mpas tend to um, kind of promote as a benefit of going big is that you can capture you know a, a range of ecosystems and you could potentially capture refugia that exist within um, you know neighboring um, ocean cells but i think but i think that's uh you know one thing to kind of keep in mind when we're looking at those numbers is the spatial extent and not just the area, but really where does that area cover? Great. As a follow-up to that, wondering um, if for these large MPAs, if it is possible to use the tool to break break the MPA up and get an idea of how different parts of that MPA might be changing. Yeah, you know, um, you could simply just uh, right, calculate the novelty index for certain sections, certain regions of the park, and see how they uh, might be changing relative to each other um, and or relative to the whole um, is another thing is, is you, know, you, you can compare kind of different um, distribution sizes since it's just using, or it's different sample sizes since it's using the shape of the distribution uh, to make this calculation. So you could 
try and find out what section of your MPA might be um, the most climate resilient or being least, least impacted um, biogeochemically. Uh, another question has come in related to this idea of being able to tell where these things are happening. The note that when looking at MPA expansion and the limited amount of resources in MPA expansion, there's been discussions about deeper ecosystems being refugia and expanding to these areas. Is there a comparison of novelty across a depth gradient or how suggestive surface measurements are to deeper levels? Um, so, so that is kind of a, a next step that um, my, my collaborators and I are, are working on is trying to see, you know, what is the, the vertical um, uh, change in novelty across conditions? Are we seeing, um, you know, is, is novelty emerging at the same rate um, at the surface, um, at the mid-ocean, and at the ocean floor in these protected areas? Um, you know, and oftentimes uh, we might also have protected areas that um, only protect the ocean floor but don't protect uh, the, the sea column itself. Um, so this is where kind of applying the tool and the approach um, in highly rigorous uh, fashion to specific individual MPAs is, is like very, um, very much encouraged. You know, we would hope that practitioners who know the ins and out of the MPA, its management, um, and that ecosystem in particular, um, because some of these uh, multi-dimensional changes across space might be happening faster in, say, Arctic regions compared to temperate regions compared to tropical regions. But, you know, again, these are all really, um, this is, the type of conversation that I was hoping to, to hear from folks is all the different ideas and all the different ways we might um, apply the, the tool. All right, thank you. Another question's come in saying that since the ONO index is a multivariate approach, is it possible to tell which of the variables are driving the changes in particular locations or regions? Um, yes, and so it's it's multivariate in that our, our or value that we assign, the last slide I, I shared, um, is the average of the individual um, uh, Hellinger distance um, for each of the six variables. And so um, that pedal figure, it showed um, kind of the magnitude of novelty across each of the, um, the, the, the variables. And so you could see that, oh, it was pH that is largely driving um, novelty in this protected area. Thank you. At the moment, we don't have any more questions that have come in, but I would encourage anyone who does have a question to please type it into the question box because we do have plenty of time left to answer any additional questions, address any comments. So uh, if you do have something, if you could please drop it in the question box, we can make sure to ask Dr. Johnson and get your question answered, get a reaction to your comment about this new index and um, that, that we can use to really see some of the ways that MPAs might be changing over the next hundred years or in the future in general, depending on the models that you use. So I'm not seeing any coming yet, but I, I, I'm wondering as a point of clarification, the index is really a measure of how things differ. So you could you could you apply it to essentially any variable that you wanted as long as you have a model in the future and information on um, information on past conditions. For example, you highlighted the different um, different parameters that you examined in your paper, but noticing that sea level rise was not necessarily one of them. So could it be applied to other parameters as well? Yeah, yeah, you could really apply it to um, different parameters, and it doesn't even have to be um, tempor a temporal comparison. You could do spatial comparisons as well. So um, the next kind of the, the the companion piece to this, which is um, in in the review process right now, is looking at not just a temporal change in conditions, looking at a, a spatial shift mm -hmm. in conditions, right? So novelty might emerge uh, within your, your local MPA or your EEZ if you're thinking at a, at a country scale. Um, but 
you also might have a climate analog that exists in a different MPA, right? And so the spatial conditions locally might have disappeared, um, but they might have just shifted spatially globally. And so, you know, we could also use this similar um, index of novelty to identify places in the ocean that we care about today or conditions uh, that support ecosystems we care about today and figure out where are those conditions moving. So a, a good example of that could be um, what are the conditions that are supporting, um, say, like tuna populations in the ocean? And where will those conditions be in the future? I know a lot of the research um, coming out is showing that tuna and similar um, pelagic species are likely to track their um, uh, biogeochemical uh, environmental conditions as climate changes. And so if we can preempt and figure out well, where are those most likely conditions going to be in the future, we might be able to plan management around that shifting um, condition. So this could uh, kind of tie into the concept of mobile marine protected areas that I'm sure many folks have, have seen presentations or been in discussions around of, well, if we have good management now where these uh, ocean conditions exist today and those ocean conditions now move to a place where we don't currently have active management or we don't have management jurisdiction, you know, we could potentially use this tool and this type of information to start the difficult long negotiations around establishing new protected areas or new uh, regulation in new areas of the ocean. Um, so, so that's you know another uh, use of this approach. It's not merely a temporal analysis, but you could also use it um, to do some spatial comparisons. Yeah, definitely potentially interesting for <clears throat> planning as we start thinking about planning placement of MPAs. Uh, we do have someone who wonders if you would be able to give a short takeaway as they got on rather late. They wonder what would your takeaway message be for someone who jumped on towards the end of your presentation? Um, my, my takeaway would be that um, large MPAs are a critical and important part of the conservation and climate change conversation, but they will not and do not have the ability to stop ocean conditions from changing and they themselves are quite susceptible to changing ocean conditions and so um, this tool allows us to get a, a handle on what is the magnitude or the relative um, um, the relative amount of change that we might be seeing in large protected areas and we can use that information to then inform future um, spatial management and planning Grant, we have one question left thus far, but we do have quite a bit more time. So anyone in the audience, if you do have a question or a comment, please do put it in the question box. The question we have right now, uh, they first they note that it was a great presentation, and then they ask what would be the best article to check out if you want to gather more information on the Ono Index work? Um, so this is the only one that's out currently. There is one that's in review um, right now. So I would be happy to, to send this back out through um, through Octo, um, through Sarah and, and the crew there um, to, to get that one out when it comes out, which is hopefully soon. Um, I'm sure as many of us know, the uh, uncertainty involved with the peer review process. Great, yeah, and if you do have a link to the paper, we can, we can drop it in the chat for everyone as well. Um, in the meantime, though, we do have another question that's come in asking, is there a way to incorporate where blue carbon systems are, are, and do you expect they will be influencing things? So is there a way to incorporate blue carbon systems and their, um, their location and potential impact on these parameters into the ONO index? Um, so that's, that's um, something I have not thought about, um, but I, I could imagine, a way to add in kind of a another variable into the model that could you know account for uh, blue carbon storage within that novelty index as a mitigating factor, um, or if you, or if you're just interested in you know kind of that change in the amount of blue carbon stored in the area, like again the Hellinger distance, um, the math 
the mathematical property behind the index is robust to, to make some of these comparisons. Okay, and I'm just grabbing a link to the paper here that I can throw into the chat for folks. Great, thank you. Yeah, as you're doing that, we don't have any other questions in right now. So as Dr. Johnson's grabbing that paper and dropping the link in, if uh, you can please enter any additional questions that you may have uh, for Dr. Johnson, we can make sure that we go ahead and answer them. Oh, um, Zach, I see that I could only send that to um, organizers. organizers and panelists. Yeah, I'm trying to get it. Okay. Uh, someone also wondering if you could give the link with the with your github oh yes and i just posted that link for everyone although it's got some other stuff going on so let me actually get a cleaner link okay. we do have someone wondering if they can they have they say they have a um, long mpa collaboration question and wondering if they can ask it with their mic on so um if that would be all right with you dr johnson i will find this person and unmute them as long as sarah has no objections either that with me all right that person that asked that question is now unmuted by me. You will need to unmute yourself in order to ask your question. Looks Thanks like very much. Uh, so George Cummings, I'm one of the 1500 uh, SDG 14 Ocean Ambassadors from 2017, now trying to coordinate the 75 countries of the North Atlantic gyre as an ecosystem. So getting MPA, multiple MPAs to collaborate in an SDG Congress collaboration coordinated uh, project implementation. So we do the right stuff at the right time with best practices, all the things that we as scientists know and understand. What do you think about, or what do you suggest, Stephen, for something like that? How to go oh. up getting, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think uh, this ties into um, one of the kind of comments we were making earlier about um, spatial spatial comparisons uh, in conjunction with uh, temporal comparisons. Because some of the the findings uh, that I've I've seen uh, in this work is that you know there's going to be um, like if you just think of your local MPA in a vacuum. Um, in isolation, it will go through a lot of change on its own. But what we're finding is, especially in the short term, the next 20 to 30 years, is we're not going to see so much this wholesale like um, extinction of environments, um, especially if we, we get carbon uh, or climate change mitigation, you know, under control. Um, but we're going to see a lot of spatial shifting um, and and a lot of that is going to remain quite local um, or regional um, within that 30 year time frame and so that's kind of where I would lean on this type of work is it's not just doing the into the one place through time comparisons but looking at you know a network of, of protected areas of countries of uh, important ocean ecosystems or species and looking at that spatial novelty um, and similarity that pops up over time because I think that's really where you'll you'll get people to see like okay well uh, the ocean uh, resources I have today in my country or in my protected area today um, are going to be shifting into you know another country's um, exclusive economic zone under their uh, management purview um, and so 
if you're the person on the receiving end of that, you're like, oh, we didn't used to have uh, the conditions that were suitable to this species of cod, but now we do. Um, so in some ways you could view yourself as a climate winner, but right, we kind of want to get away from this dichotomy of cl climate winners and climate losers. And if, you know, there's nothing uh, to guarantee you as a future climate winner that the current uh, player who has the cod species will continue to enact good management, right? There's the whole concept of tragedy of the commons is like, well, I'm going to get mine while I can. And so I think showing how um, these novel conditions are actually tying different um, jurisdictions and governments and communities together um, across space and through time, I think that's a really powerful conversation starter, um, right? Where if you support me in my good management today, I can support you in your good management tomorrow. Um, and kind of leaning into this um, cooperative superpower that our species actually does have, right? Um, we do a lot of amazing collaborations. This is one <laughs> example here today, but you know, you can scale that up to regional fisheries management or protected area networks. And so that's that's where I would uh, kind of advocate for this work going is to um, really lean into that spatial and temporal um, assessment to see not necessarily where places are disappearing, but where places are now being connected due to this um, spatial uh, reshuffling that's occurring over time. I hope that Thank answers uh, yeah. some part of your, your question, George. Thanks very much for that, Stephen. That's that's you know, there's another side to that that I kind of feel, and that is, you're you're thinking of yeah, there there becomes a winner. We'll call it an eco winner as yeah, temperature changes and species move. Those species that can move move. It's it's kind of the other side of the coin too. How do I get the guy in the greater ocean current that's downstream of me to solve their sanitation problems, wastewater problems that's coming to me and, and really impacting my environment now. And then I need to do my part because the next guy upstream from me is getting theirs plus mine, blah, blah, blah. Of course, it's exactly. all coming back around. And that's the reason the North Atlantic gyre, it, it circulates around. We're all just putting the poop right back in our own plate. But anyhow, <laughs> it's... And there's a some of this, I think, is the I'm going to call it the MPA leaders. I'm going to use the word ego, not meant in a bad way, but just they think they've got the right solution all figured out. And they're like you said earlier, they're kind of staying in their silos. How do we get those silos to go away in collaboration? Just any anything along that's kind of more the human factor was where I was thinking of than the science factor that we all understand it. Yeah, the crap's all in the water and it's all going around. So anyway, <laughs> thanks again, Steve. I don't know what you know about what to say about that, but I'll shut up and let somebody else jump in. <laughs> Appreciate that, George. Great, thank you both. Uh, we have one question left so far. Uh, we have a little bit more time though, so if anyone else does have any other questions or comments, please feel free to drop them into the question box. Question we have is, have you looked at incorporating marine bioacoustic parameters in these indices which cover the biodiversity of large spatial temporal areas? Um, I have not, but I did um, start off a conversation a while ago that I, I need to pick up again with some folks interested in um, right, the, the acoustic novelty um, of, of ocean seascapes. And so um, I have not, it's a conversation that started and uh, if anyone would like to, um, chime in on that conversation, please feel free to uh, contact me. Great, thank you. We don't have any additional questions that have come in at the moment, so while we see if any do, I do just want to say thank you to Dr. Johnson for presenting to us today and giving us a really fascinating webinar that clearly provoked a lot of discussion and a lot of really good thought. And thank you to everyone who attended and also participated in terms of questions and comments. Um, ah, we do have another question that came in that always works. <laughs> so it's a two-part question. The first is, uh, why did you decide to use SI rather than uh, silica? Sorry, why did you decide to use silica rather than the generally limiting nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, or iron? And then the second part of the, oh, there's three questions here. 
Second part of the question is, how do we tell which specific ecological components have changed? The third is, given the low number of MPAs in Africa, could you be interested in early career ocean professionals from Africa? So first is about the nutrients you chose. Why did you decide to look at silica rather than nitrogen, phosphorus, and iron? Second is wondering about which specific ecological components have changed, how we can tell. And the third is wondering if you'd be interested in early career ocean professionals from Africa. Um, we'll start with the easiest one to answer, which is the third one, which is yes, I'm uh, very interested in working with people all across the, the globe. So again, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, we'll go back to the first one, why silica rather than the other things like uh, phosphate or, or nitrogen. Um, again, this was a model resolution um, uh, question. And so, so we, we stuck with silica, also silica, does play an important um, role in a lot of organisms' process, like making shells. Um, and then for ecological changes, we, we don't have that. So that, again, is maybe a next uh, step in the novelty index is taking um, you know, what we know about changes in the biogeochemistry of the ocean and um, you know, comparing that to uh, ecological changes and, um, you know, probably running an assessment to figure out how tightly linked um, or un, or decoupled those two changes might be. You know, so could we just use one as a proxy for the other? Hopefully that'd be nice, but um, I think uh, the unsatisfying answer is sometimes maybe and never is, is going to be uh, how, how that um, relationship uh, shakes out. Thank you. All right, we are running a bit low on time and I don't see any other questions that have come in other than how might people be able to reach you if they have additional questions or um, additional information that they might want to speak with you about? Um, so I will throw my email into the chat, which is just stephen.johnson at cornell.edu. Um, so you can email me there. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Um, I guess I can also put my Twitter handle in there as well. Um, but, but again, I think for most of us, like the Twitter beware, um, it's mostly science, but it's sometimes basketball um, and you know the personal uh, things as well. So, but, but those are the, the two places I'm most likely to to, to see you. Great, thank you. Well, once again, thank you very much, Dr. Johnson, for a fascinating talk. Uh, and thank you to everyone who attended and for your participation in what turned out to be a really good whole conversation about this index and ocean climate change, MPAs, and everything surrounding those topics. So thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Yeah, thank you, Zach. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, everyone.